Hello and let's talk about Russia's COVID-19 vaccine. Yesterday saw a major announcement by Russian President Vladimir Putin in which he said the world's first COVID-19 vaccine had been registered. The vaccine doubt Sputnik V has not completed phase 3 trials yet but will soon move into industrial production. The vaccine has been manufactured by the Gamaleya Research Institute of Epidemiology and Microbiology and it will be provided to medical, military personnel and those who are extremely vulnerable to start with. Apparently 1 billion orders have already come in from around the world and production has begun. We talked to Dr. Satyajit Rath on the implications of this announcement and the way ahead. Thank you so much, Dr. Rath, for joining us. So first of all, could you uh, take us through what exactly has been the development process around this and also the announcement itself? Because there is, of course, a geopolitical issue, but keeping strictly uh, sticking to the medical aspect and the scientific aspect of it. Uh, how do you parse this announcement? So um, what the... Um, you know, we keep saying what the Russians have been doing, but more properly, what the Gamaleya Institute in Moscow has been doing is pretty much what um, a couple of dozen other laboratories and groups across the world have been doing. There, uh, there is certainly a Chinese vaccine candidate. There is certainly the Oxford vaccine candidate. All of these are one of say five or six different vaccine technologies. Right. Um, and this particular set of technologies, as far as I can tell, um, and we'll come back to why I'm being uh, cautious about this, but as far as I can tell, this particular technology is akin to one of the Chinese technologies, I think Sinovac or one of them, um, no, Sinovac and um, to the Oxford vaccine technology in the sense that it uses an, a basic virus into which the SARS-CoV-2 target has been inserted. So you take a different virus, a virus that doesn't cause disease, but into that virus you insert the information for uh, the SARS-CoV-2 target that you want to immunize with, and then you Basically, you infect people with this virus. Now, since the virus doesn't cause illness, infect people doesn't really, uh, shouldn't really cause harm. And both the Chinese and the Oxford vaccine, and I think one other vaccine uh, candidate, have all shown that while there are some, you know, redness and fever kind of effects, there is no uh, serious adverse effect to this category of vaccine delivery system. So the Gamala Institute has made, apparently, therefore, let me use the technical word, an adenoviral vector-based SARS-CoV-2 vaccine candidate. They also seem to have, like everybody else has, registered after animal experiments, human trials, phase one clinical trials that should show safety in a small number of people, phase two clinical trials that should establish whether the vaccine generates an immune response, primarily an antibody response in humans, in a slightly larger number of normal healthy people. As far as anybody can tell, these two trials, at least as far as documentation can be uh, parsed, have not yet been completed. Leave alone their data being analyzed and released, more properly published in peer-reviewed fashion, but even release. None of that seems to have happened. Instead, and this is where the major departure comes, we have the um, press conference and, and, and the show that was put on um, yesterday or yesterday? Yesterday. Yeah, yesterday. So, uh, now, this is an enormous departure. Many of us have been thinking and saying, ever since the pandemic started, that it's possible that sheer anxiety, desperation, and nativist nationalist competitiveness coupled to the consequences of neoliberal capitalism uh, uh, as uh, uh, behaving as though the world is a competitive marketplace, all of these together are going to put enormous pressure on regulatory, on drug and vaccine regulatory authorities, which are nation specific, to take shortcuts for vaccine approval. This one 
seems to be the first such example. I'm saying seems to be because all we have, uh, as far as I can tell, all that we have heard so far is an announcement by the president of Russia. Um, we haven't really seen any other documentation of any sort whatsoever. But what that implies is the following. What that implies, and this is a sort of best case guess, is that they have reasonable results from the phase one and phase two trials. Remember, these haven't been analyzed, published, and looked at, but they have reasonable results. This is not unlikely because similar technologies elsewhere have reasonable results. The trouble with this is that when you give a vaccine like this, the question of whether you have immune responses can be split into multiple levels. One is you have immune responses, but are those immune responses protective? That's a whole different question altogether. Now, you can take the blood samples from these vaccinated individuals and you can test whether those um, antibodies can neutralize SARS-CoV-2 virus. And I'm assuming that the Gamalaya Institute has evidence to say that the answer is yes. Again, the other vaccine trials have shown this, so it wouldn't be surprising if this shows. My guess, best guess at this point is that at this point, the Russian state has stepped in and said, we have neutralizing antibodies that's generated by a vaccine candidate. Enough is, it's safe, enough is enough. Let's just declare it approved as a vaccine. This is an enormously risky step. So the question becomes, why have the Russians taken this step? And as I said, the background pressures both of anxiety and desperation about the pandemic on the one hand, we have no idea to what extent the Russian official numbers, both of cases and of deaths are, are uh, correct. Um, coupled to nativist nationalist upsurges everywhere, which have led to uh, a perfect storm by converging with the, the neoliberal capitalist marketplace into a competitive, vaccine nationalism uh, in which one-upmanship of this sort presumably becomes an attractive uh, end goal. And uh, I can imagine that all of these have led to this, which is a very sorry state of affairs. Right. So Dr. Rath, for our viewers, could you just explain that in this context, what is the special significance of the third round of trials, which is conducted on a much larger number? Right. So as I said, the phase two trial says, is there an antibody response generated by this vaccine candidate? And let's assume the answer is yes. You can now ask, is that antibody that is generated capable of protecting against the disease? And one step, one small step, is that you can test whether it neutralizes the virus. But neutralizing the virus is actually quite different in the, in, a, in the laboratory, in a petri dish, literally in a petri dish, from whether in the community vaccinated people are protected against disease. And the phase three clinical trial, which typically involves thousands, if not tens of thousands of volunteers and at least months, if not years of follow-up, what it does is test whether the incidence of disease is substantially different between vaccinated and unvaccinated people. And it's only when those results come out that we know whether the vaccine works at least a little bit to protect against the disease. Because all said and done, we want protection against disease. What immunologists do in the laboratory about antibody and neutralization, it's okay. But it's disease protection that's at the heart of the decision about whether to take a vaccine into the community or not. So that hasn't been done. Right. Our next segment is part of a conversation between writer Vijay Prashad and musician Pandit Ji of the Asian Dub Foundation. They talk about the continuing ambiguity and crisis in Britain as a result of Brexit, 
which has only worsened due to the COVID-19 pandemic. How has Prime Minister Boris Johnson acquitted himself in the midst of this pandemic? And the Conservatives have a knack for being contingent. Whatever goes on, they jump on it. Whatever it is, they will do. But of late, the kind of splits towards the right and the centre, the old patrician Tory has changed. And you've got now a kind of very much venture capitalist, you know, liberalism. Let's just go for it. It's like the 19th century here. So Boris Johnson first thought herd immunity. Everyone can catch it. We'll see, we'll see who drops and see who lives. And they didn't want to admit that there was our, that was their policy, but that was essentially it. So from that time, suddenly faced with the consequences that can happen to the economy, never mind people's lives, they've been playing catch up. And everything has been about trying to put a sticking plaster on a gaping wound. And so, unfortunately, there's not much opposition to him either. So this has uh, reinforced his uh, position. So a bit like Trump, we're like second Trump. Yeah, we're, we're, we're suffering. And uh, I don't think the reckoning will come until a year or two's time. But economically, come the autumn, a lot of people are going to find themselves out of work. And it will be a shock. After the big boom of the start of the 90s, uh, the small recession, and then from 2008, we do not really know where we're going to be in uh, a year's time. So a lot of people have their heads in the sand and they're just waiting to see what happens. Um, ADF, Asian Dub Foundation, released a song recently called Stealing the Future. And yes. I've been listening to it. It's a very good song. of anxiety around Brexit, which have struck, uh, do we call it the British Isles still? I forget. This country has so many names, Great Britain, yeah, so United Kingdom, British Isles. It's a small country with a lot of names and I suppose a great deal of anxiety about what to name it. Uh, yes, this Brexit comes right before COVID, one cataclysm after the other. Um, yes. Talk a little bit about this Brexit thing, which must be part of you know, the continuing um, ambiguity and crisis in the country. Yes, uh, Brexit, I mean, it's, it's it, it, it polarised. It polarised the co country straight away and it polarised people beyond sort of traditional class lines. Historically, um, the left were very much against the European Union as well. They saw it as a mechanism by which big companies could uh, control through the European Union. So there was issues about, so even Tony Blair, when he was first stood for election, stood on an anti-European ticket, anti-EU ticket. So it's been latent, but the right has run with this agenda. And sometimes you thought, well, it's been quite convenient for a conservative government because they've been able to blame the Europeans for faults that they have committed. They've created. Uh, whether it's about immigration, whether it's about uh, subsidies, whether it's about whatever. And uh, now there's, uh, then the tendency arose to uh, attract a kind of uh, 
a laissez-faire, a new laissez-faire economy where all the old structures would be knocked back, the state would be shrunk massively and we'd just get on with it, you know. And that's where the Brexit, the modern day Brexit idea came from. So, of course, it's, 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 it's caused difficulty in every organisation structure in British society. Cut it across. So it's left a very fractured situation, which comes when COVID comes on top of this, it's suddenly like, this is the wake up call. Because there's a feelings of grandeur. The Times ran an article just last week about China. The headline was, we're going to send an aircraft carrier to China, our newest technology, you know. Um, not remembering that nearly, was it 150, 200 years ago they sent HMS, uh, uh, what was it called? Uh, Nemesis, Nemesis, the first paddle steamer up the Yangtze River, you know, up the Mekong to, to, to attack the Chinese. And there's no irony. It's like they don't remember anything. Their history, they don't remember at all. And they wonder now why the youth are tearing down statues of races, of slave owners, of Clive of India, they want to get next, but it's white in Whitehall. It's a bit hard to get to. Well, let's come back to the statues. I, I actually want to ask you some more about this. So, I mean, Britain is, because of Brexit and this vision that Boris Johnson has of getting cozier with Donald Trump in the United States, uh, Britain has decided to take a hard line on China. I mean, this hard line on China seems predicated more on U.S. policy than, strictly speaking, British policy. Um, yes. Do you feel like there has been the, a growing sentiment against China in British society as well? Or is this something just being trumped up from, um, you know, from the Johnson administration, uh, from the yellow yes. press and so on? Yes. Certainly, we always need enemies outside. This is how Britain exists. It's an island nation. It wants its enemies, you know, the Russians, the Venezuelans, <laughs> now the Chinese. And it's as if it never understood what his relationship with China was in the first place, how he got to this. What is Hong, what is Hong Kong? Where did he come from? And, and, and now the situation is... You have a, a company in the UK who is going to develop up the, tele, the next generation of technology, 5G, called Hawaii. Hawaii? Yes. And now they're saying we won't work with them because, you know, we might have our data. Britain has used this technology for 20 years in its various formats. If we do not upgrade our thing, we're going to be like the most backwards place in the whole of Europe. We will not have 5G. Everyone will have 5G. Everybody. They'll all be getting a download in a second, whatever, you know. And you know the way technology now leapfrogs. So like, say, in villages in India, people might have a mobile phone. They might not have a landline, but they have a mobile phone. And so this is the way we move on with what's most simple, most effective in the UK, we're going to design our own. We're going to make our own satellite that does what the Europeans do, you know, for GPS. Uh, I don't know, we're laughing stock. And they start, they've stopped flights to other parts of the world and back again. And part of me is relieved because if you go to other parts of the world, you go on holiday to Spain, people are just going to point and laugh at you. Why are you so stupid, you UK citizens? Great British Islanders. Albion, wherever you think you come from, <laughs> St. George, and, and it is, and so everything becomes <laughs> sli slightly surreal, uh, but also deeply damaging, and it's, uh, and we laugh at it now because we're at this point, we're like the, in the, we're like in the eye of the storm, in the hurricane, and it's all calm. Whoosh, the winds are going to blow, and... What will happen? It's, these things become catastrophic because it takes so long for the establishment to realise just how bad things have got. And then it just starts to dismantle, just falls apart. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with major news developments from the country. Until then, keep watching News Click.